Good evening, everybody. I want to thank you for joining us in the webinar on skin cancer certification uh, through the University of Queensland and with Paul Elmsley and the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. As I mentioned before, um, if you have any questions, please, please write them in the question box or the chat box, and we'll get to them at the end of the conference. Uh, just as a heads up, we do we are offering the Skin Cancer Certification course uh, June 22 through 24th in Dallas, Texas, and then also on October 12th through 14th in Tampa, Florida. Um, Doctor, uh, excuse me, Mr. Paul Elmsley uh, is the founder of the Skin Cancer Institute and managing director of HealthCert and Teladerm Technology. His background in skin cancer business management and workflow efficiency is a culmination of his, of his experience as CEO and co-founder of one of Australia's largest chain of primary care skin cancer clinics. His business expertise has helped hundreds of family practices across Australia, UK, and the United States implement effective skin cancer services for doctors and patients. He's been building and developing skin cancer education and training for the past 12 years and has a Master of Business Administration. So, uh, Mr. Elmsley, please, I would love for you to begin. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel, and uh, I do thank everybody for uh, taking the time to spend with us today to learn a little bit more about skin cancer and uh, I suppose the opportunity and the need uh, that it requires. I trust that my Australian accent is not gonna be too difficult to understand uh, if at any point in time, uh, you're struggling, please send a little note to Daniel and he will tell me to speed up or slow down. Um, as far as introduction is concerned, uh, Daniel's, I suppose, hit the nail on the head. Uh, my background is uh, originally, I suppose, pioneering the concept in Australia of developing a primary care skin cancer solution, mainly due to the fact that most dermatologists had very long waiting lists and typically the exams that were, were being delivered were focused exams where we were looking at just specific lesions as opposed to providing uh, a comprehensive skin check which was important for patients. Um, just by way of introduction, so the program which we are talking about is the Certificate in Primary Care Skin Cancer Medicine uh, which is delivered uh, in collaboration with the University of Queensland uh, in Australia. I, the importance of this slide is talking about cancers generally. Um, fortuitu fortuitously now, uh, from an incidence and from a mortality perspective, most cancers we have a handle on, or a lot better handle than we did in the past. But melanoma is one of three cancers which is increasing in incidence and mortality. The skin cancer facts for the United States. There are over one million new cases of skin cancer diagnosed every year. Basal cell and squamous cell carcinomas are two of the most common forms of cancer worldwide. In fact, skin cancer is the most common cancer worldwide. In the US, one in five Americans will develop skin cancer during their lifetime. So their lifetime incidence is one in five. Uh, just to share with you, the lifetime incidence in Australia is one in two, hence why we have a little bit of experience in the subject. The incidence has been steadily increasing over the past 30 years. Primarily, it is a Caucasian-based uh, disease, but I'll also share that Bob Marley died of a melanoma between his toes. So, uh, as I said, it's not uncommon, but obviously primarily a Caucasian uh, disease. It's growing more rapidly, obviously, in young women, and it is the most common form of cancer in uh, younger adults. The anatomical distribution of melanoma. The reason that this slide is important uh, from my perspective, as you can see here, the front of the body of the male and the back of the body accounts for over 50% of the melanomas that we find. Because of the marketing messages typically of the past where you know, skin cancer is all about the sun, so people tend to think of their face, lower arms and perhaps lower legs, you'll see that effectively unless we take off a patient's shirt, we're not going to see potentially 50% of the melanomas as such. And what's very interesting here, with a female patient, the back of the body and the back of the leg represents, once again, over 50% of all melanomas that we find. And as I said, the legs is the most common area for a melanoma to be found. Now, this is the cancer mortality rates by state in the United States from 1970 to 2004. 
So obviously the darker the red, the higher the mortality. Um, but as you can see, once again, is that the, it is typically a disease which, you know, in most states of the US is quite significant. And typically, obviously, up north, it's not quite as common, mainly because of probably lack of sun exposure, uh, but it's not saying that it's not common at all. Now, this is the worldwide mortality for melanoma. Unfortunately, in the country that I choose to live in, and I live about here on the Gold Coast in Brisbane, um, skin cancer is a major, major problem. Uh, in Australia, it's one in two, the lifetime risk. And in my state, which is up to the north here, it's two out of three. So because of, I suppose, the, the epidemic that we have in our country, uh, we were forced to develop more innovative models to manage skin cancer because, once again, we had a, a small population of dermatologists, typically in cities. There are, there are none in rural areas or regional areas, and people were dying unnecessarily. So the goal for us was to try and find a solution so we could stop people dying from this disease, which is relatively easy to find, assuming, of course, somebody is looking. Now, why is it important to develop a skin cancer service? I think the main reason is this. Early detection and treatment is important and can be extremely effective. Uh, a lot of patients or consumers would love to have access to an easy process that answers their concerns uh, and answers their questions. So um, a lot of patients will say, I've got this thing on my forearm. I think it's changing. I'd just really like to know, you know whether I need to be concerned about it or not. The other thing is, is that primary care physicians are able to do well, skin cancer head-to-toe checks very simply with a little bit of training. I'm going to show you in a moment what some of that training is. But effectively, the ability to define or be able to recognize something that's clearly benign versus something clearly suspicious is not something which takes a great deal of training if you learn demoscopy, which is a particular skill that we teach as part of this course, because we're effectively looking at a lesion and looking for specific defining features. And a mole has very defined features as well as a melanoma has very specific features which can be easily taught. Um, now, to become obviously a master of it might take a lot longer, but as far as being able to clearly define what is clearly suspicious versus clearly uh, benign is, is, is not as complex as perhaps made out to be at times. And overall, our objective is to teach you our proven skin cancer process because it is actually a process which we are teaching. Now, the seven valuable skills that you'll learn by participating in this particular program are these. How to conduct a head-to-toe examination, confidently diagnose benign and malignant lesions, take biopsies to ensure accurate diagnosis, deliver non-surgical management, perform minor skin cancer excisions, how to set up your skin cancer service in your clinic, and then how, learn how to market directly to patients. Now, the key thing I just want to make sure we're clear of here, we're not going to be able to treat everything. There are still many cases we're going to refer on to dermatologists and surgeons. But what we aim to do is to be able to provide an effective screening service, uh, diagnosis service, and management of low-level uh, cancers, so basal cell carcinomas and squamous cell carcinomas specifically. Now, in skin cancer, just so you're aware, uh, melanoma makes up only between 4 and 5 percent of all skin cancers. The vast majority, 76 percent, are basal cell carcinomas, which can be treated relatively easily and in many cases non-surgically. Now, the first skill we're going to teach you is how to conduct a comprehensive head-to-toe skin check. So this is uh, getting the patient into the practice, uh, getting them undressed, because of course if we're going to do a, a proper examination, we, we get them undressed to their underwear. And then we teach you a systematic approach, uh, which was developed with a dermatologist, to be able to start in between their hair follicles and finish in between their toes. Um, it allows you to ensure that you cover the body in a systematic form. And then if we find something that looks suspicious, we then can take a dermatoscope and have a look at it uh, to understand what that particular lesion is. We also teach you how to take an appropriate skin history, that a family history, because this information could guide our decision-making process, and then to be able to locate any suspicious or benign lesions. Now, a head-to-toe skin check 
on somebody call it with normal skin as they're not obviously uh, dysplastic nevi patients or, or people that have been obviously horribly sun damaged over their life normally takes about 15 minutes and throughout these different examples we've just put in the CTP coding um, and the rebate shown for Medicare just as a benchmark to, to provide some benchmark for everybody um, in this particular process. So a skin check alone is a, is a service which attracts a fee of $69. Now this is once again the Medicare fee as such. The second step that we teach is then obviously how to diagnose lesions themselves. So how to use a dermatoscope and then to look at these lesions. Now a dermatoscope is just a, a handheld device with batteries in it that's got a, a magnifying plate, a 10 times magnifying plate um, with LEDs. It effectively gives you, and I'm going to show you a picture in a minute to see what it, the image looks like uh, just in a moment. So we teach you how to use a dermatoscope and then we teach you a very simple algorithm to be able to tell the difference between benign and suspicious. And it's called the three-point checklist. Um, the three-point checklist has been around for about 14, 15 years, has been vigorously tested in research to, to be the best algorithm to teach uh, primary care physicians um, for this particular process. The next step on from this three-point checklist is the seven-point checklist, which is actually in one of our advanced courses, and that's where you go from defining suspicious or benign to suspicious to uh, understanding pattern recognition. In other words, looking for specific features to identify specific lesions. And the other thing that we teach as part of the program, of course, is what common benign or pigmented and non-pigmented lesions look like clinically and under the dermatoscope. Now, this here on your left is obviously a lesion. This here on your right is a dermatoscopic image of that lesion. So that's actually just a picture taken with a camera attached to it of what you would be looking at. Now, as you can see, when you stand back and look at the clinical view, I mean, this obviously looks like a, a large, ugly lesion. I'm sure we wouldn't leave this on the patient anyway. But when we have this close-up view of this lesion, we can see specific features, which are very difficult to see from a clinical perspective. Um, this particular thing here is a melanoma, so just to let you know. So we teach you the skill to understand when you look at this particular lesion, what are the three features you're looking for that can tell you whether this is benign or a suspicious lesion. Of course, in many cases, we're going to have lesions that we're not quite sure of, uh, or the patient doesn't like the look of and telling us that it has a history of change. And one of the best techniques that we can use to get a definitive diagnosis, uh, as opposed to, I suppose, treating something which is benign, is to take a biopsy. So in this course, we will teach you how to take a punch biopsy and also a shave biopsy. Now, both of these um, techniques, not only do we show you how to do them, you actually get to practically practice them as part of the program. Now, in our course, uh, over the three-day course, uh, effectively day two is all practical. We have pork bellies, we give you surgical instruments, etc., cetera, to, to practice these skills. So it's not just watching videos and then having to go back to your practice to try and deliver this. Uh, we actually get you to practice it under supervision so that when you leave the course, you can feel confidence that you can do these things. And once again, as an example below, We've just showed you some of the, uh, the coding, just so you can get an understanding. Now, once again, skin cancer checks, we normally do the biopsies as part of the skin check. Biopsies do not take very long to do. Um, we infiltrate the patient, put some records in our notes, and then obviously conduct the biopsy. And these typically would be done within a 15-minute session. So skin check with one biopsy and a skin check with two biopsies are shown here. And as I said, both of those would be done within a 15-minute um, visit with the patient. Now, non-surgical treatment. It's, there's been a lot of development with relation to non-surgical treatment. And in fact, there's a new product that's about to be released later this year, which unfortunately I can't talk about at this point. But the fact is, is that um, the scalpel, whilst it is still the gold standard for the definitive diagnosis for low-level lesions, um, uh, we can actually use topical creams to manage them. So there's obviously, we can also teach you cryotherapy as a technique, uh, as well as Effidex and Aldara, uh, which are obviously used to manage various different types of lesions. We talk about the use of these drugs, uh, complications, how to manage them, uh, and give you examples of obviously these products being used with patients, which are real life cases 
that come from uh, our experiences with these patients as opposed to information that necessarily comes from the drug company. Now, some examples we just have there, once again, of a skin check with the cryo of one lesion, um, the cryo of obviously two or more lesions, and then a skin check with a biopsy and then cryo. Once again, all of those services can be delivered typically in a 15 minute consultation. Excising lesions. Now, when we talk about excisions, we're talking about doing small elliptical excisions, typically in areas that are not cosmetically sensitive. So let's say the back, uh, you know, areas, once again, where um, it's appropriate and you feel comfortable to be able to deliver these services. Now, the process by which we work on is helping you develop the confidence. That's why um, we spend quite a lot of time practicing the surgery, practicing, practicing. So at the end of it, you can feel confidence with relation to managing this. And these sessions are run and overseen by um, a surgical oncologist. So, you know, we, we have a, a great speaker who manages this process for us. So in this particular section, um, we uh, perform, uh, teach you the theory. So surgical theory, so anatomy, uh, wound management, um, you know, complications, you know, what instruments to use, what types of sutures, why were you different types of sutures, all those sorts of things because ultimately depending on the outcome that you're looking to deliver will determine obviously what tools or materials that you use with relation to managing that patient. Now, when we do the surgical session, we start with suture techniques, so just closure techniques and, and we teach, for example, you know, interrupted suturing, uh, running subcuticular suturing, vertical mattress, and horizontal mattress suturing. Um, and there's many different reasons as to why we teach those four particular techniques, um, but they are, once again, not complex to learn, and you'll have plenty of opportunity to practice them in a supported group environment. Once we've got the suturing techniques mastered, we then go on to elliptical excisions, uh, and doing simple elliptical excisions, and, and focusing on, obviously, the geometry of doing this sort of work to make sure that we can close the lesion, uh, close the, the, the hole or the defect well, and then the different suture techniques we would use to do so. Um, and once again, at the bottom, we've just got some example uh, billing with relation to, as I said, what the Medicare uh, fee would be for a benign excision, and then on the other one, a malignant lesion removal. Um, and when we talk about layered closure is when we're using two different um, suture techniques to close um, that particular lesion. Now, after we have gone through all of the clinical aspects, so we understand how to diagnose a lesion, how to take a biopsy, and then our, our treatment choices, we then focus on obviously how to set up your clinic as such. So, what we're looking here to do is to really give you clarity as to what tools you need. I mean, the great thing about skin cancer, you don't need any expensive machinery to deliver the service. Uh, a dermatoscope, for example, ranges from you know three hundred dollars up to a thousand dollars. It's not expensive. You'll you know you'll buy it once in your life, and you'll never need to replace it. Um, and the the other tools that you require are typically surgical instruments, you know, sutures and dressings. So there's nothing expensive that you require from a tools perspective to set up your clinic, but we go through all the different tools so you can understand why you might want to procure certain tools as opposed to others. We then also focus on workflow management. So what do we say to the patient before they come into the practice? What does the reception staff say to the patient when they arrive at the practice? Um, you know, What do you say to the patient when they walk into your door? Um, the service that we're providing, from skin check to biopsies, et cetera, and then when the patient goes in to get something treated uh, at your clinic, how that is managed. So we go into quite depth as to understand that workflow management because I mean, my real goal is, is optimizing um, time and efficiency of busy clinicians to make sure that we can see as many patients as we can, but in such an environment that we're not under time pressure and the patient is getting the best possible service um, from us and our team. We also tell you how to set up an appointment book for skin cancer. Now, the reason I say this, and, and I'm conscious it's, it's quite important, 
the skin cancer patient is a very unique individual in comparison to most other patients going through a primary care practice. Typically, most patients are at your practice because you know they're sick, they're in pain, you know they're looking for, for drugs or, or whatever it happens to be. Call it the, you know they're not an uh, they're an unwell human coming into your business. A skin cancer patient is very different. A skin cancer patient is coming because of choice. They have something they're concerned about, but typically, um, when they come into your practice, they're not once again sick or in pain. So they tend to be a very different person. And as a result, we have a very different approach to how we manage them as uh, people within our practice. So the appointment book becomes critical because it has to be managed effectively to optimize the service and the value uh, to that patient because the goal is, is if they enjoy the experience um, and they feel it to be worthwhile and our experience that's definitely the case, but they all then go away and tell their friends as well to obviously come and have a look at getting their skin checked. We also teach you how to convert an examination room in 30 seconds. Now, I think the key thing we're trying to refer to here is that you don't need any special facility to deliver these services. It's a standard examination room with a dermatoscope in it, and if we then do any treatment, some of this can be done easily in a treatment room, or if you have a procedure room or a theater type facility, you then could do your excisions in them. But the key thing is that we're going to show you how to set up your rooms in a very quick time. Billing and coding is something which we spend quite a bit of time on and we give you uh, tools and resources so you have a, uh, a record of all of this to take away with you. Clinical note taking and also EMR. I'll show you an example of some EMR software and how it's been customized to specifically manage skin cancer patients. Now marketing to patients. As I said to you before, these patients are very, very different. They are there because of choice. Um, something's prompted them, whether it's they've, they've read an article, uh, they may have a family or friend who's been uh, affected by skin cancer, but they tend to be very different people that need to be communicated and also managed very differently. Now to do that, you know, we want to create or manage their expectations, and I'm going to show you how you can exceed them. Um, I think the other one is that most practices, you've already got patients walking in and out the door every day with pathology on them. You're just not looking for it. So what we look at is, I suppose, methods or techniques by which we can communicate with your patients that are already in your practice. So we don't have to go out and market this service externally um, to be able to maximize um, your patient database and the opportunity for this service within your practice. Um, we're also going to teach you how to get referrals. Now, what's interesting for us is that what we have discovered over the years is that when you become set up a skin cancer service, um, other clinicians in the area who their patients may not want to wait you know, a long time perhaps to see a dermatologist, might not have access to a dermatologist as in a, from a geographical perspective or otherwise, will develop comfort to be able to send their patients to you because you will have developed a skill and developed over time a reputation for delivering a, a valuable service to the community. And the other thing we're going to talk to you about is how to market in your local community. For example, you know, who are at, you know, who are the groups that are at the highest risk? What sort of clubs or associations are they with? Um, perhaps we do some public talks to, you know, um, improve patient awareness of skin cancer prevention and the like. There are various things which you can do uh, in your local community, which is a very low cost, which will help develop your patient base. And ultimately, our goal is overall, is to make sure the patients that are coming to see us are the ones that are at highest risk. Um, and they tend to be typically, obviously, older uh, Anglo-Saxon patients, primarily. Um, but as I said, there's a number of different uh, subgroups that we also would like to communicate effectively with. Now, how we tie all this education together is with the University of Queensland School of Medicine's Certificate in Skin Cancer Medicine. I'll go into the university in a little moment, but just to understand that this particular course is a three-day lecture program with hands-on practical workshops with further online training. So, for example, when we talk about the diagnostic aspects, we teach you the three-point checklist algorithm and you get to practice it and develop some confidence. But as you can appreciate, we only have so much time together to be able to show you so many um, 
suspicious lesions for you to practice your diagnostic skill. Once you've completed the face-to-face -face, uh, part of the course, uh, you'll then be given access to some online resources. The first one is 100 lesions where you practice your three-point checklist, as in practice the skill of your three-point checklist, and it gives you instantaneous feedback. So that when you uh, diagnose something, if you're getting it right or wrong, it'll then give you the feedback to understand that. Um, then there is also another set of 100 lesions, which is part of the assessment process. And then there is 88 multiple choice questions, which is also part of the assessment process. I'll explain that in just a moment. But we effectively cover all of those seven skin cancer skills with the goal of you being able to go back to your practice on Monday and apply these skills in your practice immediately. Now, um, the courses we typically run in a sort of a classroom format. We obviously have plenty of space, so we can do a little bit of this sort of stuff, which is the, um, the surgical aspect. So we get pork bellies and uh, we, as I said, supply all of these materials that you need uh, to sit there and be able to practice these particular skills because it's important for us uh, that you do get to practice these particular skills many, many times. Now, this is just once again a, another doctor practicing a running subcuticular suture. Now, with relation to the uh, online training and assessment, what we have here is the, the online uh, training site, and as I said, we'll show you this when you come along and do the course. But this particular site is designed so that at the end of the program, you can log in whenever you wish as many times as you like to go in and practice these diagnostic skills, to do the quizzes with the, uh, which are part of the assessment. And if for some reason you don't get the pass mark, you're able to do the assessment again. There's no minimum, no, uh, maximum number of attempts or anything like that. The purpose of the assessment is to help reinforce your learning so you can become confident in what you're doing. Now the pass mark for the assessment is 80% but all of the answers to the questions are in the, the notes and the materials that we give you as part of the course. Now, when you come along to the course, you'll get a copy of all of the PowerPoint slides and all of the resource uh, reference materials as part of the materials for the course. And once you have successfully completed the assessment, and uh, you send through a form just letting us know that you have passed. Uh, we then send you this certificate in skin cancer medicine from the University of Queensland. Now, the course is accredited um, through, I mean, in the United States through the AMA, and it's, uh, it's been approved for 18 um, PRA Category 1 credits. But also the course gives you credit into a Master of Medicines program. Uh, the University of Queensland is the only university in the world that has a master's degree in skin cancer. And by completing this course, you have uh, walked a path towards completing two of the units in the master's course. Um, we do offer more advanced courses, um, which once again also give you credit towards the master's. But this is the most important course It'll give you all of the foundation and the, the tools to be able to manage skin cancer in your primary care practice. Now, who should attend this course? Uh, the people that should attend it are the nurse practitioners and physician assistants. So, you know, your mid-level providers can learn these skills and deliver these uh, services to patients. Um, obviously, Family physicians and obviously internal medicine physicians also would benefit significantly, as well as dermatologist nurses. Now, a little bit of background on, on the course itself. Um, the program uh, has been around in, the, in its current form for since 2006. Now, over 4,400 primary care physicians and nurses from 11 countries have done this course. So it is very well tested. Uh, many, many people have done it and then taken these skills and put them into their clinical practice. Now, the University of Queensland 
is the School of Medicine is Australia's largest, and I use the term Ivy League, it's not a term that we use in Australia, we use the term Sandstone, uh, but it's uh, the largest uh, university medical school in Australia of the highest order and has, as I said, uh, the world's only dedicated skin cancer postgraduate program. And uh, as I mentioned before, it has advanced courses and uh, a Master of Medicine, which you can do, of course. Um, just a little bit of background on the university, as opposed to medical school. It was established in 1936 uh, in the medical school itself. It has over 3,200 students and staff, so it's not a small medical school. And um, it more recently uh, developed the cervical can cancer vaccine, Garvacil, with Professor Ian Fraser. So he's part of the faculty at the university. Now moving on to the presenters, uh, we're extraordinarily pleased. Um, as I said, we deliver this course all over the world, uh, but the, the faculty that we have that's delivering this course in the US is extraordinary and we're very pleased to have them. So Dr. Adam Riker is the medical director for the melanoma program at the Advocate Cancer Institute in uh, Oaklawn, Illinois. He's also a fellow of the College of Surgeons and a founding member of the Society of Melanoma Research. Now, uh, Dr. Riker's passion is, is melanoma, uh, lots of experience, a great surgeon and a great teacher. I'm sure you'll get to learn a lot from um, this high quality professional. Also as part of the faculty, um, we've got uh, Dr. Janice Johnston. Now, Dr. Johnston is a uh, physician, uh, primary care physician uh, from Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, she's a, a co-owner and also a chief medical officer for Arrowhead Health, which is, it says 150 employees. I know that's about up to 165 now, a uh, multi-specialty, multi-location healthcare company. Um, now, the uniqueness and the importance is that Dr. Johnston, um, I think about four or five years ago now, came over to Australia and did our introductory level course, which is the course that we're talking about here. She then took that knowledge back and then set up a skin cancer service inside their practice in, uh, in Phoenix and has successfully implemented it and developed a skin cancer program within their business. Um, Dr. Johnson has actually now gone on and she's about to finish the Master of Medicine, but her clinical practice now is focusing pretty much full time uh, when she sees patients doing skin cancer only. So the advantage of having Dr. Johnson in the program, besides being a, a great clinician and a good teacher, is she has taken this knowledge and applied it into her business in Phoenix and can tell you all of the outcomes. Um, and from her experience, um, she's been able to lift the average billing from about 300 an hour to 560 an hour um, as far as the, the value of the time that she spends with patients. The third presenter as part of the course is myself. Um, as we uh, shared before in the introduction, uh, my background uh, is in firstly in education, in, in skin cancer education globally, but the other one was I was the co-founder of what was one of the largest, in fact it was the second largest chain in Australia of sub-specialised primary care practices um, and we built these in half of the states of Australia and effectively changed the way that skin cancer medicine was delivered um, in this market. There were a number of other people of course involved, I'm certainly not saying I was the uh, only one. Uh, but I have a lot of experience. I've spent 13 years focusing specifically on developing primary care skin cancer services in practices and have now been able to help, as I said, hundreds of practices uh, across the world do this. And my goal is to help you also achieve this goal. And uh, even after the course is finished, uh, you'll have access to myself and we look forward to, to helping assist you in achieving this particular goal. Now, for the Dallas event, uh, which is the one coming up um, in uh, late later in June, uh, I can't tell you how happy I am to let you know that Professor David Wilkinson will be joining uh, us for this particular course. Uh, very lucky to get him out of the country, to be honest. Um, Professor Wilkinson is the Dean of Medicine at the University of Queensland. Uh, his clinical practice, he actually sees patients still, is focused specifically on 
diagnosing and managing skin cancer in a primary care setting. So he's like most of you guys out there. Um, but he also teaches hundreds of doctors um, all over the world. So, and he's also very heavily involved in research. Um, Professor Wilkinson is a, you know, is a, is a great teacher uh, and a great speaker. And you know, if you do have the opportunity to join us in Dallas, I'm sure you definitely will not be disappointed uh, by seeing uh, this man speak. Now, coming along to um, the dates of the events, as I said, we have a, a course coming up in June uh, on the 22nd or 24th in Dallas, uh, the Sheraton Dallas, and then the next course will be held in October from the 12th to the 14th in Tampa. If you do have the window of opportunity to join us in Dallas, I would encourage you to do so, mainly because uh, a couple of factors. One is the fact we'll have Professor Wilkinson at that particular program. But the second one is it'll allow you to learn these skills as we come into summer. Um, summer's obviously upon us. In fact, it's uh, two days away. But the whole key thing is, is that um, you can learn these skills and be able to develop and, and use them over the summer period. Now, we're not saying, once again, it's not important to learn these skills at any time. And of course, the course in um, Tampa will be of great value anyway, particularly for those who um, live in states that you know, typically it's sunny for most of the year round. Um, but the, the, the fact is that there is a window, particularly for Dallas, that might be worth considering if you are looking to deliver this type of service. So just in summary, uh, I'd like to, I suppose, encourage you to consider upskilling yourself and all your clinicians in your practice. Um, we have found that typically having more than one person um, uh, trained up in this skill is great value uh, because, of course, you have a, a more of a team approach towards uh, managing this type of patients, particularly if people have holidays or the like. But uh, we're going to encourage you once again to help detect and manage America's fastest growing and most common cancer. Um, we would like you to provide high risk populations with a comprehensive skin, skin cancer screening service. I mean, this, this stuff is not difficult to learn initially, but with practice, you'll obviously become much better. You'll be able to manage cases that are appropriate within your practice. Once again, we're not saying we're going to manage everything, but we're hopefully going to be able to identify, be able to biopsy and get a comprehensive and a clear diagnosis to make the decision as to we manage this patient within our practice or we refer this case to the appropriate specialist. So at least then if we're sending them on to the dermatologist, we know that it's definitely this type of cancer and will hopefully speed up um, the patient's management at the other end. And generally overall, it's providing a valuable service for your practice and for your patients. Um, the unique thing about skin cancer is that when these patients come in and get a skin check, they typically will come back annually to get you know, another skin check. So they become recurrent patients. And ultimately, if you find something on a patient, now whether that's a basal cell carcinoma or a melanoma, the patient is going to be extraordinarily grateful. And it's actually a very rewarding um, aspect of medicine um, because of the fact that you know you are finding something which potentially, as I said, could have very significant consequences if it wasn't identified early. Um, I'll just share with you one story as I finish. Um, we had a clinician who came and did our course. It was a US trained doctor. Um, and in 21 years, he had never diagnosed a melanoma, not of his own practice. He may have referred out patients that had a suspicious lesion, but he never diagnosed a melanoma of his own. Within six months of doing the course, he diagnosed four melanomas. One of them was a level three on a 16-year-old girl's hip. What was interesting is that none of these patients presented for skin checks. Um, he had been taught demoscopy. He had a dermatoscope. So rather than perhaps when the patient took off their shirt for you know, whatever examination might have been occurring, uh, in the past he sort of didn't really focus on that strange looking lesion as such because it wasn't presented or pointed out to him. Um, after he learned this skill, he would now pick up his dermatoscope and put it on that lesion to have a look at what it was and also just to help develop his, um, his clinical acumen. And in this particular six month period, he found four melanomas. Now, these melanomas may have been found later. There's, there's no doubt that could have been one of the outcomes. Um, but particularly the level three on the 16-year-old's hip, you know, that's a fairly significant cancer. Um, 
Now, her mother, uh, her, the, obviously the patient themselves were extraordinarily grateful that this doctor had picked this up and pointed this out to the patient. So it's not that we only have to develop a, you know, a specific skin cancer screening service, and we still would encourage you to do that, and that's one of the outcomes from this course. But you're going to learn a skill for life. You're going to learn something which is going to be able to change your level of confidence in being able to look at you know, strange lesions on a body or a suspect lesion on the body. You're going to have the confidence to be able to pick up a tool and be able to look at it and then be able to make an informed decision. So I think this will help you develop a skill, as I said, which will be valuable for the rest of your medical career. Now. I'd like to sort of conclude uh, the, I suppose, the presentation as such, and uh, I'd like to say that uh, I have uh, is on our website, which is skincancercourses.com. Uh, we've got sample a sample lecture from Professor David Wilkinson. So if you'd like to see him speak, um, as well as testimonials and other resources that you can look at, it'll give you the detailed program that covers the Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, but effectively, it's a, it's a well-tested course and program that we believe that uh, you enjoy and uh, look forward to uh, hopefully seeing you there. I'm very happy to take any questions. Paul, thank you. That was awesome. It looks like we do have a couple questions uh, from uh, Marianne uh, Hazlitt. I'm gonna, Marianne, I'm going to unmute you right now. It looks like you've got a great question. Uh, so uh, please, if you're Oh, wait, they're talking to me. Yep. Yeah, we just unmuted you. So if you, yeah, turn down the speakers. If you could go ahead and answer your, ask your question, I'd love for you to Paul to answer it. Okay. Actually, you already um, answered it during the webinar. So wonderful. Thank you. Well, that's easy. Okay. Great. Um, looks like we have another one. Uh, uh, Eluterio Gonzalez. Um, please, if you can go ahead and uh, turn down your speakers there. All right. Well, I'll I'll go ahead and uh, I'll go ahead and uh, ask his question. Um, it's his question was where should we take the practice workshop? Uh, Paul, it looks like you may have touched on that a little bit in the uh, in your in your talk, but yeah, I mean, so the the practice workshop. I mean, you know, uh, as I said, the the one in Dallas is the the most immediate one that'll give you these skills, you know, before the end of next month. Uh, I mean, the month of June. Um, effectively, we only run these courses, you know, said so three times a year, three or four times a year. So it's not a, you know, you need to perhaps look at that as an opportunity uh, to come through and do it. But the other thing to remember is that once you've done the course, you'll have the direct contact details of the presenters and of myself. So as you go back to your practice and you're trying to you know, put a, the service into place and you may have other questions or maybe it's, you know, we might need to talk to your, your practice manager or somebody within your practice to help them understand what we are doing. Uh, we're very happy to do this. Um, we've already ran three courses in the US and um, since last year. And you know we've been very keen and very helpful in, in getting people to set these services up, and they've found that it has made a very large difference to them and their practice. So we're uh, we, we're passionate about stopping people dying unnecessarily from skin cancer, and everything that we can do to help you uh, deliver that outcome, uh, we're very happy to do so. Great, thank you. You know, I, I Marianne had a really good question, and I, and I think you, we should go over this again, um, if you don't mind. Uh, her question was, can you legally advertise that you do skin cancer medicine as an internist uh, without being a dermatologist? Well, the answer is yes. I mean, what we don't want to do is to say we're a, you know, a skin cancer specialist. I mean, that's obviously where we start to get between the gray line of, um, you know, I suppose a dermatologist as a specialist and a, a, a physician who's obviously more of a generalist as such. Um, what we normally do is we market to the patient to come and get your skin checked and we can deliver that service within our practice. So for example, the line that we use is I've still got a um, uh, clinic here in Australia. I've actually sold out of the clinics, but I've, I've still got one which we use as a training facility. And the byline on our practice or the marketing message we use is a 15 minute skin check could save your life. And um, what we're just trying to do is to prompt people to understand, to think about the fact that a skin check is, you know, simple, easy, not going to take very long, 
but at no point do we, um, you know, purport to be dermatologists or specialists. Um, and what we do, and we teach this as part of the course, when the patient comes in for the first time, the first thing we say to them is, hey, look, I'm a family physician or internal, um, you know, with a special interest in skin cancer. So, you know, there is no confusion as to the fact that they're, um, you know, seeing a dermatologist or somebody else. And we are conscious of this, you know, we, we don't want, um, we don't want to confuse the patient. Um, we also don't want to misre misrepresent anything as well. Um, but typically, you know, the dermatologists are very busy and they deliver what we call focused exams. So in other words, they'll look at that thing on your forearm that was referred to them. Um, it's, it's very uncommon for dermatologists to do routine head to toe examinations of their patients mainly because of time and it's not an efficient use of resources, but we can deliver that easily within our practice environment um, and, and effectively support the whole process. Um, we would prefer to ensure that dermatologists are getting the right referrals because they are necessarily needed to be managed by them as opposed to, I don't know what this is, so let's just send it to the dermatologist. And in many cases, it's a benign lesion. <coughs> Excellent. Well that's awesome. Thank you, Paul. Um, looks like we might have uh, another couple questions here. Um, this one is from Richard Parker. Richard, please do me a favor, turn down your speakers. I'm about to unmute you. Richard, are you there? Richard? All right. Well, I'm gonna, Richard, I'm going to go ahead and read your question. Um, his question is, in the U.S., are the insurance companies supportive? meaning willing to pay claims for non-dermatologist primary care docs, like family docs, who offer this care only, with this being the only service. Now, could I ask you this, Daniel? Uh, we've got Dr. Berg sitting there. Are we able to unmute him? Because he Absolutely. Can, answer that. can you do that? Because I'm Dr. Berg. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Berg. Dr. Berg um, is also the owner of Arrowhead, which is the practice which uh, three years ago set up the skin cancer service. Um, and uh, David, would you better just perhaps answer that question? Yeah, certainly. Um, so let me start by doing saying this. We have not uh, opened the clinic where the only service we do is skin cancer. Um, but having said that, I'm as confident as I can be that you would get paid for it. Now, here are some of the Here's where you can be more confident. Medicare, they're going to pay for it. If this was the only service you did, they pay for it. Now, every insurance company in every state, every city has the right to make individual decisions. Um, I can't imagine that there's any insurance company in the region that I'm in that would, wouldn't pay for it. Now, that doesn't mean that there's an, an insurance company somewhere in the uh, United States that would take a different position. I'm sure there is, but it's not what we see typically. And, and David, from your experience, though, as far as um, submitting claims, you know, coming through your practice, you've not had any issues as far as getting them paid from the HMAs? No, as a matter of fact, these claims are paid very fast, very reliably and consistently. Um, and we, we do them all through proper care and nurse practitioners and PA. I hope that answers the question. I mean, it, it is a case that, uh, and this is why the importance of having Dr. Johnson as part of the program, and in fact, Dr. Berg will be joining us in Dallas as well, is they have the experience of setting this up within their practice and then dealing with these specific challenges. And as I said, they've been doing it for a few years uh, and haven't ex you know, experienced any, um, any any pushback as such. Excellent. Are there Are there any other questions out there that we can answer for you? Is there anybody that has any other questions? I will give it a give it another couple seconds here. Um, but while we're waiting, for you, oh, go on. Sorry, yeah. Paul. Yeah, so whilst we're waiting for it, I mean, uh, Doctor Berg, is there anything else other than what I've just obviously presented? Because I'm conscious of your U.S. experience, um, you would like to share with the group. Dr. Berg? Oh, I'm sorry you cut on me a little bit. I didn't know that question was for me. <laughs> uh, sorry, I apologize. Um, I was just asking, um, because obviously you've had the experience of delivering the service for the last few years in Phoenix. Uh, outside of my presentation, is there anything else you wanted to share with the group? 
Um, you you covered it all, Paul. And uh, but the one thing I would add is that from a um, from two points points of view, this makes a ton of sense in a primary care facility. One is from the clinical perspective. Uh, at least in our market here in Phoenix, the dermatology community just is not taking care of this problem. And um, I mean, there's a lot more interest in cosmetics and higher paying procedures uh, than skin checks and cryo and biopsies, the typical skin cancer stuff. Every dermatologist wants to be involved when it turns into something bad. Um, but before it is, or if it's more minor, or um, especially for skin checks, they really don't seem to have an interest. And it just makes no sense to have people waiting four months to get in um, because they don't schedule that many uh, skin checks into their schedules. Uh, so from a uh, clinical perspective and clinical need perspective, it's very well accepted in our community here in Phoenix. Um, from a, And the patients are just so excited to get this stuff done, and they're, it's really easy to get them to refer folks in, their family in. Um, even if they don't have skin cancer, it's easy to get referrals. If they do have skin cancer, it, it's hard for, to stop them from talking to their friends about it. Um, now, from an economic perspective, it makes a lot of sense, too, for the reason you said, Paul, is it almost it, it, it almost doubles at least 80% more revenue in a one-hour period um, with the same amount of expenses. So the, the, our margin typically can go from... You know, I could say it's five times higher from a net margin perspective for every hour we do skin cancer compared to general family practice. So clinically and economically, it makes a lot of sense. Wonderful. Um, and and as I shared before, is that you know it's a very different type of patient that you're going to be dealing with. And ultimately, what you're going to be giving them is peace of mind, um, which you know, for for a patient that's concerned about skin cancer, whether it's you know very specifically this lesion, or you know, I've I've got things all over me and I can't see my back, and I don't know if there's anything perhaps I should be concerned by. Um, <coughs> patients are grateful. You know, if you find something, as I said, they're extraordinarily grateful. But even if they don't find something, they're grateful that they've actually had a comprehensive skin examination. Um, it would be very rare that any patient has had an examination as thorough as we're going to be able to teach you to be able to do. Right. You know, it, it looks like we have one more question from uh, Richard Parker. Richard, I'm going to try to unmute you again. If not, we'll go ahead and read your question. Uh, so get ready. Richard, are you, are you there to, to ask your question? Richard? All right. Well, I'll go ahead and, and read off your question uh, now. Um, and his question is, any other challenges a family doctor may experience from area hospitals, insurance companies forcing the doc to see a certain percentage of basic primary care in addition to general skin checks, once again with the desire to do only skin checks? Um, Dr. Berg, would you be able to answer that? Um you know, fortunately, I, I can't because it's so varied depending on the market you're in. But what I can, and we have not done only in checks in our practice, um, in the in the in the you know the overall practice with all the providers. Um, Dr. Johnson does do primarily skin stuff. So if an insurance company was out there and they're looking, they would see that at least uh, I'm going to say 80% of her stuff is skin at this point. But we've never heard anything from them concerned about it. Um, but it doesn't mean that if somebody was only doing it, that a payer in some market wouldn't say that there was an issue with it. I just I can't see that they would. Um, but I guess it's always a possibility. We haven't experienced that. Yeah, and and just also understand is that you're delivering a uh, a direct, more direct, and possibly in some cases a lower cost service to solve the problem because ultimately you know if, if it doesn't get managed at this level it's going to get sent on further um, which possibly could cost the system a lot more so um, you know as far as a primary care physician doing this work uh, you know once again appropriate for them to do the sort of work they are um, you know it would be difficult for someone to to argue it uh, but as I said uh, what we've also found just so you know from our experience it's very rare that a doctor only ever does skin cancer as such. They typically will still end up doing some family medicine, 
mainly because there's some patients they just can't let go of, I think, probably the best way of describing it. Um, but normally, if you build the right blended model, where you've got you know nurse practitioners doing the screenings and you know the family physician can be doing screenings and or treatment you know these sorts of things so it's not just one person the load can be shared that allows you still to be able to do other aspects of medicine that you do still enjoy I mean um, we find with most physicians they have areas of interest and passion um, and being able to pursue them is obviously ideal uh, but you still obviously have skills you want to maintain uh, through that process so in Australia we probably have uh, you know, let's say 800 of the 21,000 doctors do skin cancer, but probably only about 200 of them would be full time. So the vast majority are still maybe doing you know three days a week or you know something like that, three to four days a week or two days a week of skin cancer, and then on the other side they then may do some general um, family medicine. But we're going to show you when we design the appointment book structure how you can do that and be able to mix standard medical practice with skin cancer in such a way that it's very simple and clear for everybody. Excellent. Well, it looks like that's about all we have for questions and, and answers right now. Um, Paul, anything you want to leave us with? Or Dr. Berg, anything you want to leave us with as well? No, I, I don't think so personally. I, I think the key thing is if anyone does have any other further questions, you know, please don't hesitate to, to ask. If you go to the uh, Skin Cancer Courses website, there's a Contact Us button. Just um, click on that and send it through the question. If there's something you wanted to ask that perhaps maybe not in the, the public environment. But otherwise, um, look, it, it, it's one of those things you're going to learn a skill and at a relatively low cost that will, as again, enhance or develop your clinical practice for the rest of your medical career. This is not something you learn and you do or don't use. The fact is you're going to see patients every day, you're going to see a lesion on a patient, you're going to go, what is that? And we're going to teach you the ability to be able to work out what that is. Um, and as I said, whether even it just means it's incorporated within your existing practice or you want to create a service, that's completely up to you and we'll help you do both. Um, but as I said, it's a very gratifying skill to learn because as I said, you will save people's lives. Great. Dr. Well, Berg? Dr. Berg? Yeah, I'll just reiterate that uh, it does change the mood of the practice in family practice when you are saving lives. It's not very often that family practitioners experience uh, ex have so much um, um, where they can have such clarity on the fact that they did make a huge difference in somebody's lives. We've had just countless, countless, dozens and dozens of folks that. Um, where there's a good chance they would have died in six months to a year if somebody hadn't made them come in for a skin check. And it's uh, it's quite rewarding. Not that other things that we do, treating diabetes and stuff, aren't, aren't, aren't rewarding, but this is where everybody knows without, with a great degree of certainty that uh, the strong chance of life was saved. And it does change the mood around the office, and it uh, has ripple effects um, that are hard to explain. Great. Thank you, Dr. Berg. Uh, Paul, thank you so much for, for doing this with, with us. I, we really appreciate it. Um, if you do have more questions, please, you can go to skincancercourses.com or you can visit www.a4m.com. Uh, both sites are great, can help you out. If you have questions, you can always call 561-997-0112. Uh, or you can also email info at a4m.com. And again, a4m.com or skincancercourses.com. We'd love to answer any questions you have. Paul, Dr. Berg, thank you so much for this. We really appreciate it. Um, and we will all be in touch soon. Again, questions, don't hesitate to ask us. Thank you, everybody. Have yeah, a good pleasure. Day. Excellent. Goodbye.